following is a presentation of Learfield IMG College. From the Georgia Southern Sports Network, powered by Learfield IMG College. Wings up, Eagle Nation! Touchdown, Georgia Southern! This is Inside Eagle Nation, your all-access look into Eagle Athletics. Take a look through all the other action in Georgia Southern Athletics this past week. A lot of road action. A lot of teams hitting the old I-16 out of town. Getting on the steel horse and taking us to parts north, south, west, wherever. Can't really go too much farther east. Now let's return to the Learfield IMG College Studios. Here are your hosts, Colin Lacey and Danny Reed. That's a fact, Jack. into another edition of Inside Eagle Nation, your all-access look inside Georgia Southern Athletics. Flying solo tonight, Danny Reed out with the Eagle Club Tours. Again, they were up in the North Augusta area tonight at the Top Golf for Georgia Southern's Eagle Club. The last one coming up later this week as they will head to Effingham County before the three up in Atlanta next week when Georgia Southern Baseball actually up in Atlanta as well to take on the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. We will dive into that plenty more as we go throughout this week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. Georgia Southern Baseball, a little bit of a tough week. Went 2-3 and three on the week, two midweek games against Kennesaw. We will dive into everything Georgia Southern Baseball this past week a little bit later on. A jam-packed episode of Inside Eagle Nation. We'll catch up with Ryan Chambers, former radio voice for Georgia Southern Baseball. Also did football sidelines. Sold a lot while he was here as well. We will dive into his stories throughout the next hour or so. Danny Reed catches up with Seth Schumann, former Georgia Southern Baseball pitcher, now with the Washington Nationals organization. Danny catches up with him a little bit later. Later on, and then we talk Georgia Southern baseball against the Troy Trojans this weekend at J.I. Clement Stadium. And we talk to the voice of the Troy Trojans in Barry McKnight later on this evening. But we get things started with Georgia Southern softball getting two wins in the midweek up at Mercer in a doubleheader. It was a 17 to 5 run rule victory in six innings over the Mercer Bears on Tuesday, and then a 6 to 5 victory in game two of that doubleheader. Game one was Coach Perkins' 300th career win as a Georgia Southern head coach. And then a tough weekend in Sunbelt Conference play as Georgia Southern softball headed to Mobile to take on South Alabama. Friday was an 8-1 to one victory for the Jags. 3-1 to one the victory for the Jags on Saturday. And then South Alabama sweeps 4 nothing on Sunday. One more week for Georgia Southern softball in the regular season. They will face Georgia State Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Senior day will be Friday against the Georgia State Panthers over at Eagle Field. One of the few weekends you get Georgia Southern baseball and softball in town at the same time. No midweek for either one because it is exams week on campus here at Georgia Southern. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for Georgia Southern softball. 6 o'clock on Thursday and Friday. 1 o'clock to wrap up the regular season on Saturday against the Georgia State Panthers. Since the last time we talked, Georgia Southern men's golf was out in El Dorado, Arkansas. We talked about it on last week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. Came in second in the Sunbelt Conference in match play, falling to Little Rock in the finals of match play. But Georgia Southern sitting right around the top 50 in the country, so they will wait Wednesday the selection show for men's golf as far as if Georgia Southern will be able to get into a regional Standings look like they should be able to get into a regional, but we will wait and see when and where Georgia Southern men's golf will be able to go for the NCAA regionals. Again, Wednesday, the selection show for that. This past week, Georgia Southern women's golf, finding out that they will head down to Tallahassee. Monday, they will start it off for the NCAA regionals after winning the Sunbelt Conference Championship. We will dive into the five-game week for Georgia Southern a little bit later on in this week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. But as we mentioned, Ryan Chambers, a great friend of the show, being able to catch up with him earlier on today. He shared some of his thoughts. Spent a lot of years in the press box for Georgia Southern Baseball, calling Georgia Southern Baseball and the Georgia Southern Sports Network. A great relationship with head coach Rodney Hinn that he talks about. But we go to the conversation. It's Ryan Chambers, former Georgia Southern Sports Network. Welcome into this week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. A special, special guest this week, week again with Danny out because, because of the Eagle, Eagle Club tours. tours over in Dublin this week. But Georgia Southern, a special friend of Georgia Southern, especially Georgia Southern baseball. Ryan Chambers, the former voice of Georgia Southern baseball. So sidelines for Georgia Southern football. Sold did pretty much everything here at Georgia Southern at one point in time. Appreciate you joining us, bud. 
Yeah, man. I didn't realize you meant on video. Um, I thought you meant radio, which I thought would really signal well to the last time you and I did an interview now infamous on Fox sports 15 years ago. The problem here is you have to be on camera and we can't fake that. Right. Um, but, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited and excited to answer real questions. Yeah. That was one of my favorite memories. You want to tell that story? Yeah, you absolutely. Us? Go, you, you tell it. Because this was when we were just getting into the blue white weekly. It was starting, this is probably 2014, 15, maybe uh, a little had a bit. Well, no, cause we were, we were in Bishop. Um, yeah. um, we, we were the we only were Bishop. Ones in Parish. It was all Parish. Excuse me. We were the only people, in, which was interesting when they shut the campus down, when yeah. the dude was on, when the gunman was on the loose. <laughs> And Draper, Draper yeah. and I protected that house. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're going to get way off. Continue. Continue. We all had our own locker room. It was awesome. But we did, we're doing a segment on blue white weekly for, I guess it was the baseball radio crew, you and Draper. And you're like, no, no, no. I've, I've done enough of these that I can just interview myself. And the best part is the start of your answers. You were chuckling to yourself for the answers. <laughs> Yeah. Jake. Um, I think Jake Coleman, I think saw another side of me as he reached out to me later and he was like, you're a real sick dude. Because I realized he was doing the editing and he was right. like, I get your answers. He said, but who's asking the questions? I don't hear the raw. I was like, nobody, Jake, nobody's in the room. It's just me interviewing myself <laughs> and making myself laugh. Oh, that was awesome. Good times. There was a lot of, a lot of stories that we probably can't tell on this. Yeah. But the fact of when it was Chris Blair as the general manager for Georgia Southern Sports Properties or what turned into Georgia Southern Sports Properties over a couple of years, Chris Draper, me and you crammed into Parrish. Those were some pretty fun days. So when we when I left the advancement side of the house, when Tom was hired, Tom Kleinlein was hired, um, and it was all, or July, that would have been – God, what was that? 13, 11, yeah, yeah, somewhere 13, around that after year. my first year, somewhere around there when I came over, because at the time I was in advancement and, and funny enough, I still even 10 years into Georgia Southern was never technically an employee of the athletic department. <laughs> even that one year that I didn't get paid to do baseball. And right. that's another story, but, um, is that when you could only do midweek games or couldn't do midweek games? I couldn't do midweek games. That's when I started in advancement. There was a little bit of a political tug of war over how much money I was raising. Imagine that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, you know, I'm, I was taking advantage of being able to be out on the road with athletics and, and making a lot of relationships even stronger. And a lot of people wanted to support what we were doing over at the college of health. And Tom was pretty smart when he got there and realized that there are sideline guys out there like swim, like <laughs> hustling money for some department he's never heard of. Um, but, um, yeah, the, the dominoes kind of lined up, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember when we, when we went over, I was hired when the Nelligan thing happened. It was in July. Um, that, and that was crazy. I mean, that, that 45 day run was, we were up there all night, like, no one knew what, I mean, none of us knew what we were doing. We had these sponsorships and of course in the MMR world, they tell you, you know, there's, you know, $400,000 in cash, which means like 150 and a bunch of free pizza coupons and <laughs> you're trying to find a million dollars in 45 days. And everyone's mad at you. I became like, it, you know, town enemy number one in a lot of places, but that's, you know, that's the growing pains that's big time college athletics and that's good. You know, and Georgia Southern needed that eventually. Um, and I'm proud of what we did. We, we, uh, started, a you know, to get a pretty good reputation around the country, Chris and I, and, and you and, and Draper and our team. Cause I mean, we were, we were just crushing it there for a couple of years. And that was, I mean, you remember those days, there was so much fun because we knew how far past expectations. I mean, we were flying past numbers that nobody thought was possible because of really good corporate partners. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, I know the, the mantra is that you don't let the radio guys sell and, and I, and I get it. I totally get it. I I'm not like, I, you know, I used to be very upset about that, but I've mellowed and I've gotten older and I've worked, you know, pretty high up in big time college athletics. So I, I, I see the potential downfall when you, when you do that, but at least in that moment with Chris and I, we caught lightning in a bottle uh, because we had created so many great relationships. Chris's like intimate knowledge of broadcasting and radio. And then my 
relentless picking up a phone. I don't really have much other skill set than that, but otherwise it, it worked in, in being in that office for that many hours, four people crammed in an office, which is ridiculous in the beginning, but we, we love each other so much that we didn't even really think about it. I mean, Draper and I couldn't be di- more different as people, but for some reason, like it's the only two people could be shoved in an office like that and it worked and it's actually fun. And we made games of it and we made weird games of it. Um, yeah, man. Th- those were the days, man. I-, I look back on it all. And I, Chris, Chris and I talk about this all the time. It's like, you'll never get something like that again. It'll never be that good. I, it, you just can't, you can't replicate it. You can't, it, you can go other places, but we were so close, got along so well and, and offset each other uh, personality wise. That, that was, that was fun. Before we get too deep into this, want to dive into what you're doing now. You've gone all across the country, San Francisco, Virginia, Talk about what you're doing now with the Chris Long Foundation. Yeah, I, so I'm director of development now with the Chris Long Foundation. If you don't know, Chris uh, played in the league, won two Super Bowls with the NFL Man of the Year, donated his entire salary uh, to to education uh, initiatives. Did, did living under a bridge thing. I got a ton of ESPN, uh, but he's he's found he founded Water Boys, which is a program that drills international wells, mostly in East Africa, Tanzania, uh, that part of the world. And uh, kind of came from toward the end of his career, he, he climbed Kilimanjaro and was like at the base of the mountain and just realized like you have like this part, which is awesome. And all these, you know, rich guys and football players are doing this, you know, life changing hike. And then you walk into the town and these people don't even have water, you know, and, and as he's, you know, Chris is a real pragmatic guy. I mean, and that's really why I decided to take the job because his brain and my brain are very similar. Like I, I can be very pragmatic. If you give me a problem, I'll just go find a solution. I don't even have to talk about it. Just go fix it. So he, it became enthralled with this country and realized through talking to people that this one thing could change the entire trajectory of, you know, towns and villages and cities in that part of the world, just being able to provide them clean, sustainable water can help the economy thrive. The local education gets better because these kids are hydrated. The, you know, it, it really adversely affects women and children are like marching three miles with these big things on their head. I mean, the, that means they can't be at home with their family. It means these kids can't be in school. It's just crazy. And so he started water boys reaching out to people to build wells. Uh, that was the first, you know, the first challenge was we're going to do one well for every NFL team. And then it kind of evolved and now it's into uh, giving and reaching a million people, which we're halfway there at 500,000 through our efforts uh, for, for providing these things. So he kind of did it on his own forever. Um, and water boys was an incredible success, but I think as he's gotten away from playing now, he has a really successful podcast, uh, green light, which is doing really well. He realized that you need to like create a system. Um, so, and I was at UVA in athletics with corporate corporate sponsorships with with uh, UVA. So we had some connection. Played at UVA, um, and you know, people put us together. I was looking to make a change after COVID, and and my divorce, you know, kind of changed, you know, my career thinking. And, uh, like I tell people, it's the best pay cut I've ever taken. It's, <laughs> it's life-changing work. I get to not be this terrible mean guy that beats up people and negotiations, but loves these people at the same time. Cause I have great relationships with my sponsors, but you know, the job that we have to do is drive revenue. And now the job I have to do is, is do something good for the world. And, uh, feels good when you go home when you, when you do some of that work. <laughs> I'm into your time here at Georgia Southern. One of your first experiences with Georgia Southern baseball, I think it might've been the first trip you took was to Hawaii. Yep. You're not a big plane guy anyway. Nope. You rode with Roger to all parts of the country and the equipment truck. Mm-hmm. But what was your first trip to Hawaii? Like it was awful. So we're on the plane. I give you a couple of stories. So number one, I have a lot of anxiety. For, for this because we're flying to Hawaii. I just gotten married. That should have called me, caused me more anxiety, but that's another story for another day. Um, I get back from my honeymoon. I get on the plane, I fly over there. Um, the challenge being all this travel, but also this small, tiny detail that I had never really done play by play before. Now that was a shock to everybody. <laughs> so that was an issue that I had to confront. Um, okay. Now we're, you know, you know, it's like when the, the dog catches the car and it's like, right. Oh, I got to go off the air now. Um, 
here we go. So uh, I had done some play by play, but baseball was not one of them. Uh, baseball was my love, but I, you just, when you're doing some high school games, like I had most of my TV was TV broadcast football and you just don't do a lot of high school. So uh, moving to the collegiate level and then taking on that opportunity, we were flying and the, the stories have been legendary over the years. So we got, we got some bad turbulence, right? So I don't fly well to begin with. Uh, everyone knows that knows me well, intimately knows my stress level and my anxiety. And I'm usually a pessimist about things. So I had convinced myself I was going to die. Um, and when you see, and I usually like look for like the stewardess and the stewardess were gripping and in tears and people were yelling. And I'll remember two things from that as I'm thinking that this is probably the end. Number one, Pat Osterman at the time, sports information, everybody knows Pat, all the big longtime Eagle fans know Pat Osterman is. He was sports information forever. And then when I came on, I brought him on radio because I knew how good he would be. Um, Pat got shook a little bit. Pat's like a six, five cornbread fed dude from the Midwest, right? Those guys don't really get shook. Like right. I do. I could tell he was shook. Now he wasn't panicking. The guy was, but I could tell he was, he was nervous. That really did a number on me. And then I look over to my left. Now you remember people are screaming. It's bad. I will never forget the lasting image. And I, I this was, this started a tone and in a, in a friendship that still lasts this day in a, in a, in a respect. I look over and Rodney Hennon is eating a sandwich. As if nothing is happening. I mean, just they give you those like box lunch sandwiches. And Rodney just is just sitting there eating it. And he as if nothing is I say, good grief. That dude is hard. Wow. Um, but yeah, we get there. Hawaii was way out. They play at a pro park. I don't know if they still play at the same. I'm assuming they probably still play at the same stadium. Um, and it's a pro park. It used to be like a maybe a triple A stadium. It looks like Richmond's, the the old you know, they take the, those cookie cutter, you know, stadiums and, uh, but they still were way out in front of, you know, today's, you know, beer sales and alcohol. So, so they sold beer. We were set up on the concourse. So I start, you know, grabbing a couple of beers, you know, a couple of laughs. And we were in the intro. I told Pat, I said, uh, I'm muted. I said, look, Pat, we're about to hit 15 seconds. I need you to know I've never done this before. He starts laughing. I was like, no, I'm serious. Here we go. <laughs> and off we went and, you know, nine seasons at baseball. And I, I loved every minute of it. It was, it was fun. It's somebody that was inevitably going to come up in a conversation with you is Rodney Hennon, somebody that I know that you have immense respect for in the program that he's built here for Georgia Southern. What makes him so special and the perfect leader for this Georgia Southern baseball program? You're always going to be consistent point end of end of sentence. He will always have them compete. It is unbelievable at a school like Georgia Southern, to have that long a stretch of consistency. And I get, I get like, you know, people want more regional wins and you know, regional appearances and the, the number of just, you know, conference title games that we've played in the last, I mean, I don't, I don't know how many every year it's been a lot. I mean, more, I mean, there, if I remember the streak, it's been more times than not appearing at least in the last six, seven years. Um, just to get that far, I mean, baseball is such a crap shoot. I mean, you just, and especially when you're in a one bid league, I mean, what do you want? What do you want to do? I mean, you, 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 you do the best you can and, and they've been 30 plus wins. I don't know how many years, every year I was there, except for one, um, I think. And, and pretty much that's been the standard that Rodney's set. He's in, and he's, he just, he strikes a really good line too. I've always respected that baseball is one of these things where you travel, all the time. Right. And I think he does maybe of all the coaches I've ever been around, he's not, he's not too hard on kids, but he's also not your best friend. And I, that's kind of what it has to be. And, and he does, I've always respected him so much for being a guy that I think like if I played for him and, 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 and let me say this too, I, I would say things that weren't easy to hear. And I would go talk to him and I never felt like I couldn't, like I can walk in his office and say, I need to talk to you about something. I got something that's bothering me. Um, and he was so, so supportive of me, especially early. I, I was not in the easiest position taking over for Nate. He'd been around forever and, and people loved him for obvious reasons, but we were very different. Nate and I were very different. And Rodney was at the time when it could have been the other way around, uh, was supportive of what I was trying to do. And I was trying to grow the network. I was trying to add affiliates. I was trying to, you know, put money on the books. I was trying to sell it and broadcast it and do all these other things. But, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't, there's very few, forget coaches, there's very few humans I have more respect for than Rodney and his family. And that place is, is lucky to have, to have had that kind of run of consistency and success. You're a big proponent of the people make a place special and talk about some of the people. I know you had really good relationships with, with Rusty Cram whenever you were here with women's basketball, Roger Inman. I think everybody has a great relationship with talk about some of your favorite people when you were here at Georgia Southern. If you, if you don't have the right people in place, you're out of luck. I, I don't care what kind of system you have. I don't care what you have to sell. You have to have the right people in the right seats. And Georgia Southern caught lightning in a bottle in a lot of different ways, having the right president in the seat, having auxiliary services in the right place, having athletics, you know, the foundation in the right place, having people across campus to help. But you also had this like guard that had been there and had institutional knowledge like a Roger Inman, but also could to pick up and help. Um, yeah. I, I think the world of Roger in, in, Another guy like Roger, when I first got there, Roger, you talk about God just walks in your office. Like Roger had no problem telling me that I stunk on radio. <laughs> I'm serious. It was like, I don't, you know, it's fine. My ego so massive. It's, you, it's cool. You can say that. Um, but he became one of my biggest proponents. Um, he used to get so mad when I'd call out Mike cheek for bad umpiring and, you know, and I'm like, Roger, everyone talks about bad. I am a radio. How come I can't say he's bad at umpiring. Like what's the difference? You know? Um, so, you know, Roger's great. Rusty was great. They just, it, it was just such a fun time, you know, like we, we knew we were probably going up. We, we, we'd done everything we could in the Southern conference. Uh, there was no, that was not an institutional fit anymore. But I used to tell people when I, when I would be able to talk to people up on high because of my position that, that they would listen, I'd say, look, you know, I mean, it's one thing if you want to go to six home games, at Paulson, and you think, you know, here's Furman and Elon and all these you know, good, good schools. It's not, it's not a knock on them. I said, but travel with me for women's basketball, travel with me for baseball. W watch me have to break in the press box at Davidson because nobody gets there until 15 minutes before first pitch. And I go in there 30 minutes and they think that's the strangest thing they've ever heard because they don't even put baseball on radio. And, and, maybe, and maybe they shouldn't. It's, it's just a different business model when you, when you're playing, you know, private school, college athletics, you put all your eggs in one basket and you know, everything else is you try your best, but, but you don't put a lot of effort because you don't have a lot of the money to do it as a sport. So, you know, that time of moving up, you know, having, having guys like Roger, you know, that knew, knew, you know, what was going on, Mike Tiddick, who is still one of my favorite people. It, when, when he shouted me out on his hall of fame speech, like I had like seven people that night send me texts and that was awesome. But um, yeah, man, some, some great people it's, and, and good people there too. I've, I've been, I'm so impressed with Jared and Chris. I knew when they hired Chris Davis that, and, and I told you guys, I was like, let's go. Like, here we go. Like now this is going to get real because you've got some guys in the seats that know that they've got a little bit of background in this, especially understanding revenue models. That's it. Man, I, I love game day experience and marketing and social media. All those things are great. You got to raise money, man. That's the only way this works. And you got some cats that know what they're doing on the revenue side. And, and I, I have a lot of respect for those guys. I enjoyed meeting them down at Boone. I'm fired up. I'm reengaged. Um, and I hope the fan base is too. You talk about making the transition from the SOCON to the Sun Belt and everybody knows how big of a fan you were of the SOCON at the time, but going around your first trip around the Sun Belt, it was one of my favorite things to see how excited you got when we went to a new Sun Belt conference stadium. It was like a, I was, it was like a child on Christmas. And the thing is like a lot of those institutions knew how big a fan I was. I had been beating the drum for the Sun Belt for years. It was the obvious fit. I mean, it, it's perfect. It was a perfect fit. It's a perfect geographical footprint that smart people, smart schools, um, you know, peer institutions and academically good state schools, you know, and, and that's where Southern needed to be. It was very obvious. And I think you can just get, and this applies for anything, any job, I think you can kind of get stale, you know, after a while and you just, it, it just got tiresome, you know, going on the road where we would have fun as a team, like going, you know, out after the game or like hanging out with coaches, eating breakfast, like traveling, that, that stuff's fun. But it just got stale going to places where we weren't really wanted anymore. Like we just weren't and, and take that for whatever. I don't care. It's true. Like Furman didn't want us there because we don't fit. It makes sense. Like it doesn't make sense when we go play Wofford in a playoff game and we buy out all their tickets. Like that's not, 
that's not good for anybody. It's not good for us. It's not good for them. Like, it's just awkward. It's like, you know, this just, it's, it's not working anymore. So, uh, the Sunbelt obviously is the, you know, probably the biggest winner in realignment. Uh, and I'm, I'm a fan. I live in Crozet, Virginia. I live 45 minutes from JMU. Um, Marshall's an easy trip. Um, you know, go out to the beach to ODU. I, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm, I'm right down the mountain, um, in between JMU and UVA as the crow flies. So I think it's, it's a great fit. It's going to be a lot of fun too. It's going to be a lot of fun for fans to go to places and get pushback, have fan bases that look like you, that act like you, that care like you. Um, yeah. And, and only growing better with, with Southern Miss and these others up here that got added. It's been a fun run for Georgia Southern baseball this year. And there's talks of an at-large bid possibility for Georgia Southern. If they're not able to get the Sunbelt conference crown, the last time that Georgia Southern was in a regional, it was down in Tallahassee and you and Chris Draper were there. Talk about that environment, that experience. We were just down in Tallahassee for a midweek game against Florida state, but a very different environment. I would imagine. Yeah. I, I'll, let me get back to that. I think where where it's going to be interesting is if, you know, I, and I've seen the projections with Southern hosting or playing host, um, you know, the last, last time it was a significant seed like that was 09, which was my first regional experience out in Fullerton, which was in, it was unfortunate too, because, you know, Southern, I think probably should have been a three that year and they were given a two, but to take a two, you got to go across the country. And I, I just don't think that travel did us very well, uh, obviously with the, the bad couple of innings there in, in game one uh, and then the Gonzaga game. Um, but, you know, the Florida state regional was awesome because in Draper and I talked about this on the air, Howard, Sam's, you know, 10 or 15 pitches in the first inning and we're looking at each other. It's like, there's no way these guys don't have a shot. They just don't have a shot. There's no way. I mean, they, they like to put, you know, or at least at the time, I don't know if this has changed, um, you know, but under, under, you know, their old, you know, Mike Martin staff, you know, they, they took pitches and Sam Howard literally was throwing it like nasty just off the corner. And it, it was just one of those games where once we score in runs like this ball game's over, like this is not probably going to be competitive and you know, Busby has the big one. Um, it was exciting. You know, I know everyone wants to see Jameis pitch. He came in late, but uh, that's a cool place to play too. Like Florida state's a really good college baseball environment. Um, you know, and I, I love going to places like that. Um, I think the Sunbelt's got an opportunity for some of that too. Um, you know, I, I've know I've heard great things about Southern Miss. I've never been there. Um, and, and I know, you know, some of the old school Sunbelt schools, uh, like South Alabama and Troy that, that have built up a program, but, uh, yeah, regional baseball is fun, man. I, I still love it. I still listen to, you know, I was listening to Chris on the call Sunday with the LSU Georgia, uh, you know, and I watch you guys or listen to you guys, uh, watch some, uh, and, and I was at Virginia. Um, I was at the UVA game on Sunday. I, I've done some radio for them, some fill in work, um, at times. So, uh, yeah, I, I love college baseball. It's, it's my favorite of all of them and, and probably one that I'll always follow. All right, there's a couple of just random stories that we've got to get you to tell. First yeah. one, I think it was the first trip that you and Draper had taken to Texas for baseball. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you guys got a, a very nice welcome wagon from a Texas folk. Yeah. So the interstate and in, in, if you, if you go in like, so this is San Antonio and this is San Marcos, San Marcos, right? Not San Marcos, yeah. San Marcos. And then this is Austin, right? right. So you, what is that? 81 or I, 61. I don't know. Something There's an interstate right. that runs that. So interesting in Texas, and I, this is not the way it is in Georgia. This is also the way it is in California. A lot of these interstates have like a, a, an access road that runs parallel. It's like a four lane, six lane highway that you can, you can drive the, that road and, do what you want to do, or you can get on interstate, but these two, these two paths go. So I didn't know that I was, we were in a, we were in a, in a rental car, Draper and I, and you have to also understand Draper and I's personalities are a little different, um, but we're very close. Right. So we were coming away. We were going to go to the hotel and we wanted to like, it's been a long flight, long trip, you know, settle in and then you know get changed. And we're going to go downtown. We've never been, it's our first trip to San Marcos. First time, first time in, well, no, third time in Texas for me. I had just spent a lot of time in Texas. Um, first time in that town, but I thought I was on the interstate and come to find out it was not, I was actually on the access road. So I'm telling you, it's like three 30 and then the part of town, that nobody's in. So I'm driving and I said, okay, 
And I'm and, and also people that know me know, like I'm the slowest driver ever. I'm the yeah. most conservative driver. I'm not putting anybody in. I'm not in that big a hurry. And you are so, the one that has to drive. Yeah. I'm all, yes. I, yes. That's all. <laughs> one of my many quirks for the Georgia Southern radio network. I am the driver. No one else is putting their hands on this wheel, but no one ever seemed to, to mind. They're like, you know, we could turn this into a party bus and Ryan right. get to drive everywhere. Radio. A, right. It's radio. Cause he's a weirdo. <laughs> he gets sick anytime he's in the car, if he's not driving because of the loss of control or whatever disease. But so I decide Chris and I are in the car and I decide to, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to merge. There's the, you know, the next exit's one mile this way. And there's nobody anywhere around me. So I go over three lanes pretty, pretty quick. There's a car or truck is about, I don't know, like 20 yards, like maybe 20 yards behind me, 30. I mean, not, not close. Right. And he just loses his mind. I mean, just goes nuts. He's hanging on, he's honking on the, the wind, the, or honking the horn, screaming and yelling. Which honking the and, horn is one of your favorite things. So I am enraged because honking of horns sends me to this, I don't know, to this weird place of anger. And I said, okay, well, it's go time now if this guy wants to get serious. So I go back across through the lanes and I pull in to a parking lot. And again, everything on the side of town is empty. There's nobody anywhere near anybody. Even in the, this commercial strip we were in, I, we just pull into empty parking lot. So this guy comes in. So, so think of it like this. I pull into a spot, right? So Draper is in the passenger side. I'm in the driver's side and this crazy dude pulls in his truck like this. Okay. So my window is up. Draper's is down. This guy's screaming. He has a dog in a truck. He looks bad. Like life is really beating this guy up pretty good. Beat up truck. He's older. Um, and he's just screaming and yelling. And, and I, I am, while I'm mad, one thing you can say is that when bullets start flying, typically I become very rational and I can be the, the mediator here. And I said, look, dude, if, if that bothered you, that me changing lanes, I'm a blinker on, I don't know why you were upset about this, but if it bothered you, then I'm sorry. Like I truly am. Like, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not out here trying to like fight 60 year old guides in parking lots right. on, you know, purpose. So, and what Draper and I later said was, I think that made him mad. Like it made him even more mad because I'm just trying to be rational. Like I'm, I'm kind of laughing about it. this is, a, this is a bit absurd that we're screaming at each other in a parking lot. So he goes and turns. Now later Draper says he thought he was getting a gun. I'm so naive and dumb. I'm not, I don't know what he's doing. And he comes back with one of those big gulp cups, like 64 ounces from one of the taco plays, like Del Taco, it's full of sweet tea. And he literally chunks it into our, into our window. It goes all over Draper, of course, very little on me. Um, and he speeds off, right? Right. Well, now, now, no, all right, forget that. So I throw it and drive and I pursue this guy a couple miles. I'm flying through traffic. Cause he's way out front because it took us 30 seconds. Like we were startled. We didn't know what had just happened. He is Draper's drenched. And I, I so we get, I I'm running red lights. I'm trying to catch this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm so mad at this point. I don't even, I'm not thinking rationally. And he finally Draper the whole time. Now remember again, Draper is definitely the, 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 the more uh, uh, intimidating of us right. two. Draper's six five six six. He looks like he wants to punch somebody, you know, at all times. And uh, former former closer, former pro baseball player. And he's pleading with me, dude, just pull over. It is, this is not worth it. Like I don't know what you think you're going to do with this guy, but this guy could have a gun. And that's when it realized, like, okay, he's he's serious. Like this isn't, you know, it's I think a pretty loose carry state in Texas. Um, so yeah, I pull over and we kind of look at each other and like, what just happened? I mean, we just literally got assaulted with sweet tea. I think he thought I was messing with Texas. I wasn't messing with Texas. I was just trying to get over a couple of lanes and get back on the interstate. Um, maybe it's 10. I can't remember, but, but otherwise, you know, wonderful people. I hear you guys are on the outside of the press box now. Um, yeah. I don't think, I don't think they would like that very well. Um, last time that happened, the school learned a very valuable lesson of putting me amongst the visiting fans. Um, but you know, Draper's been amongst the visiting fans when you were in a press box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I put them out in North Florida. 
the last time we were at North Florida. The, well, the last time he was at North Florida was the game I refused to do. And the only one of two games, I think I just finally, it was in the end. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like these people, like this is, it just, and, and Draper got it. You know, Draper thought it was a little ridiculous. It's like, come on, man, not that big a deal. And it's like, no, it's not a workable press area. Like they're, they're, this isn't set up to do what they're trying to do. And it's very frustrating. So old me just gets frustrated and goes out there and just makes a bunch of jokes that probably make everyone mad in the press box. New me is like, you know what? I just won't do it. I mean, Draper was great play by play guy. He learned very quickly the, that great training that he had. Right. In, in, in broadcast journalism really paid off. So, you know, Hey, if you want to do it, go for it. I mean, we got to do, we got to put it on the air. I think you went with them that last game. Maybe no, I somebody back in the studio. Cause we knew we were going to get cut off at eight o'clock. That's right. That's right. Cause you knew the phones drop at eight. Right. Cause they could never fix that. And right. So he went down and did it himself. But the time before that, there's just not room for two people. So that, that's when I got bit by the hornet. If you remember, um, <laughs> I had, that. had big whelp on my neck. Cause there's a hornet's nest in there, right. you know, like, cause no one did. It's just, it was a disaster. So, um, yeah, I sat in the booth in this tiny little booth that you couldn't barely even get one person in. And then I ran a headset out to Draper and Draper sat in the last row of the stands and did color and then did of course play by play when I walked off in the woods for three innings. All right. Before we let you go, I'm just going to open it up. Your favorite stories of when you were here. Mm. When we play, when we got back in the playoffs in football with Jeff, that there have been 10, 2010, I think when we realized we were a seat short on the team plane and I volunteered to ride the equipment truck with Roger Inman, that was fun. We went to, and then of course, what I didn't realize the first time was it to, uh, God, where'd we go? Was it William and Mary? Maybe it wasn't that far. What, what I didn't realize was that everybody's superstitious, superstitious, which I am not, I'm uh, famously not superstitious. I'll go stomp all over the lines. I don't care. I don't believe in that stuff. So, um, but because they are, I couldn't get back on the team plane. So I had to ride to Delaware with Roger in a, in a, in a equipment truck. Um, was William and Mary where they asked you to give your credentials back? Yes. Wow. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> Cause I work with those guys. I, I know a lot of those guys over there. Oh man. We gave them, that was bad, man. They, what a attitude. So yeah, William and Mary reached out to us the Friday before the game. And I don't think there was Vegas lines, but I think most, they were better seated. Although like the second half, Georgia Southern's a completely different team with Brent Pry and, and Jeff and that staff. Um, a couple things had happened. They were, they had been quoted in the paper about, I remember, they, and of course I'll take anything and the locker room it as if like, I'm mad about it, but they said something to the effect of they'd be okay against the triple option because all these guys played against the wishbone I, just all these weird comments. It just didn't seem like they were. And then two th two things happened. If you remember, number one, they reached out to, to us and said, Hey, after the game on Saturday, if you can leave your credentials in the press box, we're going to use them next week, which obviously if you lose, you don't need credentials. Your season's over. It's the playoffs. Right. So we made sure everyone heard about that. Um, and we were, I, I, you know, I had a super on shoulder. And then number two, I think they knew we were pretty upset and they wanted to like jam us a little bit. So we get to the press box and they had labeled it Georgia state radio. Oh, which, I know that. Yeah, oh yeah. No, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, sir. And then like, we literally just wipe them off the field in the first quarter. I mean, it was, they were so unprepared for that offense and, and really we were rolling outside of North Dakota state. Nobody was going to stop that, that team, um, that year. And, uh, yeah, like we went and like, I, we did, it was so immature and so stupid. I mean, it was just so dumb. Like we went and like, you know, scratched out Georgia State and like corrected it and like scratched out William and Mary and put, you know, VMI or I don't know, whatever stupid thing we did. But um, yeah, yeah, I think that was. So, so you know, those were good stories. All, all of, you know, like just every, like every day, like it was just so much fun. Like I, I love my time at, at, at San Francisco and, and at UVA, it's cool. Like UVA is cool. Like to, to be in an ACC school and to like, just Sunday, like Tony Elliott's going to be great. The head football coach, like he had worked the, the last event I did with Chris and our foundation. And he comes over and talks and that's, that's cool. Like, 
when you get to a level where you've, you've earned respect from people in, in college athletics and, you know, and they, they acknowledge that, but it, it'll just, it'll never be that way. Again. Like you just can't have that level of friendship and like be on the inside of something that you knew was growing and Southern had this trajectory that, that we were going to be a part of if we could help get the revenue and, and get it off the ground. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, going to work, I, I never, I never didn't want to go to work. Like, I don't think, and I, and I, and I don't think I ever didn't go to work, uh, that I could remember. And that probably cost me a marriage, but, um, it, it, it gave me some memories and you can't put a price tag on that. Even the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'd say it a lot that you and Draper and Chris and Terry and Russ, Frank, now Danny, you guys are responsible for what I've been able to do and a lot of responsible of what I am today. But one of the first memories of that, at least on the on air side of it was the first game I ever called when we were at Kentucky for women's basketball, you and Blair and Draper were sitting in the office listening to it. Wasn't it like an 11 o'clock tip or something? Yeah, really 11 a.m. kids game. We lost one Oh three 38. It was awful, but I will never forget the three of you listening. And for some reason, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no shot of a clue. You said Kentucky University. I said Kentucky University, and my phone starts going ah. off like somebody just died. You idiot! What are you doing? Yeah, you're fired. We used to fire you all the time, and you yes. kept showing up. Like Colin, you're fired. Leave. Do not come back here again. And I'm like, what is he doing here? I thought we got rid of him. Oh, yeah, I got no, fired was, like ten great. times a day. Especially oh, baseball man. when we started playing like real or fake. I got fired all the time. Oh man, it's real or fake? Ah, the the secret the secret text line that oh, only former yeah. players had. Some of the secret words that we would drop. Everyone knew when it was blowout time. Man, I started getting blown up with the alumni <laughs> texting that wanted to hear stupid words on the air. Oh man, no, those are those are great. And I, I tell you too, like what I think always was helpful for you was that all of us had like such different personalities and certainly yeah. different styles. You know, like. You know, none of us took that job. I can speak for all of us. Nobody took those jobs thinking we had to leave those jobs. Yeah. I've, I knew likely I wasn't going much further in radio. I could do something else. Chris, it was very obvious was one of the best in the country. So probably likely wasn't going to be there forever um, with some of the offers and, and how all that works. But, you know, he's so good and professional and man buttoned up and can't rattle him. And he's so prepared and, such a broadcast. I mean, he has the, that, that intelligence because his dad was in the business and, and owned some stations, but, but, it, but, it, but a good thing because he wasn't handed a silver spoon. It's not like, you know, he got anything other than, you know, knowledge and learning the, the radio, you know, world and understanding it from the back, the back end of it, which is where his real value is. I mean, he's got a great voice. It calls a great game. That dude knows everything about everything that happens. Whereas a lot of guys just show up. Um, he taught me all that. I taught you, you know, we taught you that, okay. you know, um, and then of course I just try not to say cuss words and just be a stupid Homer and try to make people laugh. Cause that was my style. I'm, you know, Steve Holman, like that's who I listened to and Skip Carey and, you know, like, so what I'm Marino sitting beside me and I start blasting them on the air. I felt like it didn't need someone need to say it. Like this officiating is terrible and he's not going to do anything about it. And, and then the phone call, Chris used to get a lot of phone calls on Monday morning. Um, and I always loved him for that because he, re he really, he, uh, he spared me probably a couple firings uh, early on uh, and protected me and, and made promises that I would behave. Was and, one of those uh, when you almost fought the Georgia mascot? No, that, I think everyone understood that. Like that was, um, Actually, no, Chris wasn't there for that. So that that's was right. That's the only game outside of a few baseball games that he and I did together. Um, it's the only time Chris Blair and I, I'll never forget Chris Blair did color for me. I did play by play women's basketball. It was a Sunday afternoon. He was on the color side. We had, um, that's when, um, oh gosh, coach was doing color in the early years with him, with, with Chris. Coach Kearns, yeah. Coach Kearns. And, you know, when his, when his health started, he didn't travel as much. I remember a game before we had anybody to back up and I was doing play by play. Chris said, Hey, can you do some color this year on the men's side? This was like maybe 08 or nine or something very early. 
And uh, he, he, I went to Jacksonville. We played Florida state Jacksonville at a, at a neutral site. I did color there. And then we went to Athens Saturday night stayed. And then the women played Georgia and Georgia was like really good that year, preseason, like top five or something and spike. And so I mean, it's no secret. I went to UGA. I graduated from Georgia. Um, so I'm familiar with it. I'm familiar with Stegman. And so spike is their, you know, their plush mascot that like turns its body or her body around inside and like jumps on its head and does all that stuff. It, spike kept coming up press row. It's, it's a tight press row on the other side, at, or at least was then. And was like hitting me in the back of the head. Just I'm sure being funny or she or he thought it was funny. I don't remember what I said. We were coming back from commercial break. What did I say? I said something in regards of. If he hits me in the head one more this, time, I'm going to punch him right square in the nose. I'm a, or I'm a, if this thing, if this mascot touches me one more time, I'm going to punch you right square in the nose. And I was looking, the mascot was looking back at me. And then I realized what I had just said. And I followed that with, this is becoming a real scene here, huh? And I looked at Chris. And Chris took his headphone off and he couldn't breathe. He was laughing so hard. So we were going to the line for free throws and I was trying to get the train back on. So I went back to normal play by play, but you could hear Chris like fumbling with the microphone because he was laughing so hard and he just, he couldn't stop because he couldn't, I think he was in shock at what I just said in the mascot, just, the, you know, cause they make these mascots, they look so joyous. And this right. mascot's got this like smile on his face and just staring at me. And some poor kid who's trying to be funny thinks I'm going to stand up and I'm going to punch you in the nose. If you do this again, cause you're bothering me. I'm a, you know, I don't like people in my space. So, um, you know, and Chris is as professional as it gets. So for, for him to go off the rails like that, you know, and that was always the thing with Draper and I, our, our standing rule, my role, I was trying to tell the score, but also try to make him laugh so hard that he couldn't breathe. And there's, there were a couple of times it happened. Um, but, uh, but yeah, different personalities. And I think it, it made it all work. <laughs> Really appreciate you taking some time. Really enjoyed the time that we had and got to catch up in Boone this year when you made it down for Georgia Southern App State football. Looking forward to catching up again, but appreciate you taking some time with us today. Dude, I love you. You know I love you. I love all you guys. I love the fact that we have nine versions of a text thread that we talk <laughs> on every day. And some of that. Have we that, found him like, yet? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, no. Uh-uh. No. No. Uh-huh. No. We, we're, we, we had an update on Wednesday. Um, you know, sources close, you know, have some, some ideas, but I know not that I know of, but we, we're going to continue the truth's out there, man. <laughs> Appreciate the time. Love you, buddy. Love you, dude. That is one of my favorite interviews that we have done in 180 episodes now, but Ryan Chambers, former voice of Georgia Southern baseball, also on the sales side, did sidelines for Georgia Southern football for a number of years too. One of the greatest people had the opportunity to work with, be around, and that group of guys, Chris Blair, Chris Draper, Ryan Chambers, Terry, Russ, Frank, now Danny, there is no words to say what that group of people means. But a great conversation. We move on to another one as Danny Reed caught up with former Georgia Southern baseball pitcher Seth Schumann, now in the Washington Nationals organization with the Wilmington Blue Rocks. Danny? Inside Eagle Nation podcast continues visiting now with one of our former Eagle baseballers trying to make it up to the show. He said a stiff second different organization. He was a Georgia Southern Eagle from 2017 through 2019. Seth Schumann joining us, the Washington Nationals farmhand. Shu, it is great to catch up with you today. Appreciate the time, man. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here, Danny. Drafted back in 2019, sixth round by the Athletics, got traded last year to the Nationals, currently playing with the Wilmington Blue Rocks. What's pro ball been like? Uh, it's been fun. You know, ever since I left Georgia Southern, it's um, it's definitely been an eye-opening experience, just learning a bunch of new things and um, making a bunch of new friends and traveling all over the country, seeing new places. It's been real fun. Uh, I've enjoyed every second of it. How did Statesboro get you ready for what you're going through right now? Um, you know, I had a lot of great teammates down there. I had a lot of great coaches that taught me a lot. Um, definitely had a lot of learning experiences and, um, yeah, we, that, that, uh, you know, blue collar mentality that coach Hen always talks about, and I, you know, I still carry it to, with me to this day. And I think that definitely helped me a lot getting ready for pro ball. I know it's pretty much 24 seven with playing ball professionally, but how much do you get to check in on the boys down here? 
Um, I definitely check in on every game, whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, whatnot. Um, you know, I still um, talk to JP Tig a lot, and he can't kind of keeps me posted on how things are going. But uh, you know, the guys are off to. I mean, they've had a really great year so far, and uh, I'm looking forward to them. You know, getting to that championship game, winning, and getting to a regional. Yeah, that's something that you've got quite a bit of experience with. Not only did you start multiple championship games in 17 and 19, but you had the honor of starting a game your freshman year. And it was at J.I. Clement Stadium against South Alabama. I know that that's been five years, but take me back to that day and what you remember about having the opportunity to get your team to a regional. Uh, that was, I mean, that was an awesome experience. Just that whole weekend, those three days of ball, um, you know, pitching on Friday and then having to come back Sunday and start. It was, it was awesome. I just going into the game, I was, I had so much confidence in our guys and I just felt like we were in a really good spot, no matter what happens or how I even did or how I even pitched. Um, but no, that was a fun day. We, I mean, so close, you know, one inning away from pulling it out. Um, but no, that was a, a great game. Great year with a bunch of um, guys on that team. You finished up that Louisiana game that had the season online because the rain, the first two days, everything became single elimination. So you closed out that first game, that 11 inning victory. At that point, did you have any idea that you'd be able to come back and much less even start a game? Mm, not really. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I threw, I don't, I think it was an inning and at third or two thirds, whatever it was, but um, I kind of maybe thought I'd be in relief, but let alone start that game. I was, um, that kind of just showed me the amount of confidence Coach Hennon and Coach Green had in me, and uh, meant a lot, a lot to me, and it definitely gave me a boost going into the, into the start on Sunday. Twenty eighteen, you end up being the Saturday guy. I remember the shutout you threw at Little Rock, and then the complete game in the tournament against Arlington. But twenty nineteen is where you really got a chance to shine. Your one year as the number one guy, ten quality starts out of sixteen starts. You led the league in strikeouts. Being able to be the guy for that year, what did it take? to be as good as you were that season? Um, I think it was just the accumulation of, you know, the, the previous two years, all the work I'd put in and, um, you know, the respect the guys had for me in the locker room. And, um, you know, we, we just had a great team that year and I knew that everyone had my back and I had theirs. And I knew that every time I took the mound that we were going to compete and, you know, definitely showed. We, we had a great year. We definitely had our bumps in our road, but we made all these championship games. Um, and we fought our butts off to the very end. And uh, um, even though we didn't win, I thought we had a great year that year for sure. Yeah, I've talked with Coach Hennon a lot about you, and he has one of the best quotes I've ever heard about another player. He said about you that good follows you wherever you go. What do you think of when you hear someone with that kind of clout say that about you? Uh, it means a lot. Um, you know, coming from Coach Hennon and just – I never really think of it that way, but just hearing that from, from him means a lot to me. Um, I have a lot of respect for Coach Hennon. You know, every time I see him, it always brings a smile, smile to my face, just bringing back memories or just talking about how the guys this year are doing and whatnot. But um, that definitely means a lot coming from Coach Hennon, for sure. We were really proud to see you get picked in the sixth round in 2019, being a chance to be in the same far system as Chase Cohen, who's now in double A, but We'll get to the trade in a minute, but COVID hits in 2020, and not only does it call off a lot of what we had known, but you guys didn't have a season. How did you deal with that? Uh, it was definitely tough at first, but um, it was just something we had to get used to. Um, I spent pretty much the whole year in Valdosta. Um, I was working with my brother a lot and throwing to a bunch of local high school or college guys that were down there. Um, just trying to get as much work in as I could. Uh, and then I ended up actually you know, coming back to Statesboro that fall and got to um, throw to some of the hitters at Georgia Southern, which has, you know, helped out a lot tremendously. But it was just a grind. Just had to get through it and try to make the best of it. What helped you get through that? Um, just knowing that I don't need to take any days off. Um, there's plenty of guys that are in the same situation as me and I got to make the most of it, whether, um, I'm putting in extra work on my own or, 
you know, whatever it might be, just because I know there's no coaches around or anything like that. So it's kind of like it was on me to just make sure I get my work done. And then a year ago, we hear about the trade that sends Jan Gomes and Josh Harrison out to Oakland, and you're involved in the trade right at the deadline. You end up changing organizations. Right. You go to Wilmington. You're back there this year. How did they notify you that you are not only – joining a new organization, but you're basically turning your life upside down. Um, it was definitely shocking for sure. Um, as you could imagine. Um, but, uh, once we were about to start batting practice in Lansing and our manager called me and the two other guys that got traded over and was, um, you know, I didn't think anything of it. He was like, so you guys have just been traded to the Washington nationals. <laughs> and I, I mean, I was like, <laughs> I was like, didn't believe him, I guess at first, but then he was like, yeah, y'all got to get off the field and, you know, just get ready to pack up your things. And then some of the players in the field kind of came over and uh, I guess word kind of spread from there. And it just kind of hit me. I was like, wow, like this is actually real. Like I'm literally going to have to leave tomorrow morning, but um, it was definitely a pretty cool experience for sure. Arriving in a new place with people that you probably hadn't seen before, how did you get yourself acclimated to not just a new situation, but a new system? Yeah, that's always um, scary, you know, maybe nervous or whatnot, going into a new locker room with guys you've never met before. Um, but I just, you know, tried to be open-minded about the situation. And like I said earlier, I, the Nationals are a great organization. Couldn't ask for a, um, a better team to get traded to. And we had a great group of guys in that locker room that I got to know really well. And um, I've made a ton of new friends since getting traded, which is awesome. So I'm, I'm really happy that I was um, came over to this organization. You struck out Juan Soto yet? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see when that time comes. <laughs> All right, we watched you for three years here. I mean, there was a time where you were doubling up with football, but then when you became full baseball, end up with 22 career victories, 10th in school history, and strikeouts. But what kind of pitcher are you now that you're playing professionally? Um, I've definitely learned a lot about myself, about each of my pitches, and know my strengths, know my weaknesses. And I try to, you know, pitch off based on my strengths and – um pretty much the same type of guy. I'm, I'm, you know, trying to get as many strikeouts as possible. I mean, what pitcher wouldn't, of course, but obviously it's still got, you know, good command. I think that's one of my, um, better qualities as a pitcher is having to be able to command, uh, you know, most of all my pitches and, you know, obviously trying to get better on each mile speed for sure. So, um, you know, going to work every day, trying to get better each and every day and, um, you know, hopefully take that next step here this season or, you know, whenever the time comes. And I remember visiting with you while you were down here. It was fastball changeup, but the breaking ball was sometimes it was a slider, sometimes it was a curveball, depending on right. what it was doing. But now right. you're throwing both. So yeah. being able to learn two different versions of trying to do the same thing, what has that transition been like and how has that worked for you? Yeah, it, it's definitely um, – it's been frustrating at times trying to get the separation of, of the two pitches. Um, you know, I'm always, I want – I want my slider to be a lot harder, obviously. And then the curveball, i um, definitely taking some, taking some off of that. Um, but just the learning how to control your curveball and, and throw it in there for a strike whenever you want to. And, um, you know, play that off your fastball. It's definitely been a learning experience. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I've gotten a lot better with both of the two pitches. So I'm looking just to build off of those in game situations instead of just throwing them in bullpens or flat grounds or what have you. 22 has been a really good start for you. 12 and two thirds innings, just eight hits allowed, 13 strikeouts. What kind of communication do you have with the hires up in the organization and your rovers and your field coordinators about where you could potentially be at some point this season? Um, I'll be honest, we haven't really talked too much, you know, with pitching coordinators or anything in that position. Just guys that, I mean, they'll come in and uh, we'll have different guys come in, you know, maybe every other week and just kind of talk to us or whatnot. 
Um, but leaving spring training, they said I was in a good position. Just keep doing what you're doing. You know, you know, by the end of the year, maybe you'll be in double A or who knows, could be in the big leagues, you know, um, cause we, we had a, actually had a guy last year that was in high A when I got traded and ended the, the season starting the last day of the season, um, in the big leagues. So that, I mean, that's always something I think about that anybody could be here in high one day, the next day in the, in the show, like it's nothing. So that's just how baseball is. What was your favorite moment here? Mm, man, that's a tough one. <laughs> you have a lot of them. You have a lot of really good ones, but if there's one that right. sticks out. Um, put me on the spot. Hmm. I would probably say – I'd probably say I got two. One would be obviously starting the championship game my son, on Sunday my freshman year and seeing Ryan Cleveland hit that home run to take the lead, <laughs> that bat flip, that one. I still get chill bumps thinking about it. Um, but, oh, man. Or, or the um, – Sunday, uh, um, my last year at Coastal, um, that one was pretty. That was pretty special too, because I started. I think I want to say I started Thursday or earlier that week, and I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to throw Sunday because I'd you know thrown like six, seven innings or whatever. But actually, the night before on Sunday, I texted Coach Green. I was like, I want the Baltimore, and he was like, It's yours. And I was that's all I needed to hear. Um, so just like I said, knowing that the coaches had that much confidence in me, that that was all obviously one of you know a great memory for me. But definitely Cleveland's bomb for sure, number one. But it's been great getting to know you these last few years. It's been a lot of fun following you professionally. Continued success to you, and we'll uh, we'll catch up and do something like this down the line. Appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you, Danny. Also, want to say thank you for always checking in on me. Um, shoot me messages, whether it be once a week, once a month, or whatnot. It means a lot to me that you're keeping up with me for sure. That's Eagle baseball pitcher Seth Schumann now in the Washington National System. Colin Lacey, back to you. Thank you, Danny. Once again, Seth Schumann, one of the best to come through Georgia Southern baseball, started out with Georgia Southern football, then made the transition and turned into one of the best pitchers that has come through Statesboro. Now in the Washington Nationals organization, again in high A Wilmington with the Blue Rocks. Hopefully see him in double A and in the show very, very soon. We dive into the last week for Georgia Southern baseball. A little bit of a tough week for Georgia Southern. Ranked for the second consecutive week, but Georgia Southern falling on Tuesday against the Kennesaw State Owls 5-3. to three. That's an Owls team again that came in number 29 in the RPI to start the week. Ended up the week at about number 24 in the RPI. Got the revenge on Wednesday with a 9-6 to six victory. Danny Madden gets the victory. He goes a third in an inning in a third, rather, after Will Robbins started, went two innings of one-run baseball, striking out two. Will looked really good in his start as well. Then Georgia Southern turns it to the weekend against the Coastal Carolina. Shauna clears Coastal, comes in 59th in the RPI. They are up as high in the top 50 now in RPIs. But Georgia Southern falls to Coastal Carolina 5-4 to four on Friday. And then it turns into a 6-4 to four Coastal Carolina victory on Saturday before getting the victory for the Eagles 3-2 to two on Sunday. So Georgia Southern takes one out of three from the Coastal Carolina. Shauna clears, but that is one that that's a really good college baseball series. And the big part for Georgia Southern, the free bases on Saturday and then not being able to get that big two-out hit. We talked about it all weekend on the broadcast. But trying to get that big two-out hit, Georgia Southern got those on Sunday with a couple of big home runs, one by Austin Thompson and one by Noah Ledford that led off the seventh inning and ended up being the two deciding hits in that series as Georgia Southern gets the 3-2 to two victory over Coastal on Sunday. Again, we mentioned it a little bit earlier on this evening, but this being exams week on campus for Georgia Southern, no midweek for Georgia Southern baseball or Georgia Southern softball. So the Eagles will look ahead to the Troy Trojans coming into J.I. Clement Stadium this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 6.30 the first pitch on Friday, 2 o'clock on Saturday, 1 o'clock on Sunday. And to dive deeper into what the men of Troy will bring to Statesboro, we catch up with the voice of the Troy Trojans in Barry McKnight.
We continue on this week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. We dive into this weekend for Georgia Southern Baseball. Again, no midweek for Georgia Southern Baseball with exam on exams on campus. But we dive into what Georgia Southern will see this weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at J.I. Clement Stadium as the Troy Trojans will make their way into town. And nobody better to talk about the Troy Trojans than Barry McKnight, the voice of the Trojans. Barry, appreciate you joining us. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Getting a chance to uh, talk a little baseball here from the Troy campus where things things have been good around here lately. It's been a good home schedule for Troy and um, a, a big challenge going on the road for four games this week for us. So, yeah, it's it's going to be a challenge. No question. We talked about it last week with Coastal Carolina. The Chanticleers probably playing their best baseball of the season. Troy in that same ilk. A three-game sweep against Georgia State this past weekend. What is it really about this Troy team that has been clicking? Well, the thing that uh, that really has been evident, and I wish I had an answer why, is we've been really good at home. Uh, I think Troy now is eighteen and five at home uh, and on the road, not not bad actually, right at about five hundred, but just you know so much better at home, the home crowd and all of that. The the. The first year under Skyler Mead has been um, it's been interesting in that he has been really good at being open minded about a lot of things. I loved the previous staff. It was a it was phenomenal group of people. Uh, Coach Mead has kind of set himself uh, apart as a guy who is uh, who, who will experiment. And it has really helped out lately. Rigsby Mosley, who, who you know and have seen play and have seen hit and all that. He's been an all-conference player. He was a freshman All-American player. Well, this is the first year that he has pitched in college. And he's been a revelation. Uh, he has been, over the last couple of weeks, um, a weekend starter. And it's been legitimate for a guy who had not pitched in five years. In the Georgia State series, you know, Troy won the first game 10 to 1. It was a one run win in the second game. And then on Sunday, with uh, the series, you know, a chance at a sweep, uh, you know, there was a rain delay. Our starter had to leave. And um, at the very end of the game, with the game on the line, Troy was leading by one. We threw a guy named Brandon Schreff, who has been an outfielder and a designated hitter, has played all three outfield spots. Uh, he had only thrown maybe two innings all season long. He only had one other appearance. And with the game on the line, Coach Mead brings Brandon Schreff out there and get a couple of runs. And uh, he ends up getting the win, getting a strikeout to end it. So it, a lot of those things has been just him not being afraid to try new things. Uh, it's very... It's a very energetic approach. You know, Troy runs, Troy hits and runs. Troy will, you know, do a lot of different things on offense. They try a lot of different lineups. And um, it's been fun for sure. I, I guess the thing that's been uh, the most interesting for us is just how unpredictable everything has been. And it's worked out by and large this year. You talk about Rigsby Mosley and everybody around the Sunbelt Conference knows what he has been able to do at the plate. He's been a huge part of this Troy success the last couple of years. But I remember the first time that he was going to get a start, it was in a midweek on the mound. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, is this just a one-off? Is there somebody that can't go? But then it ends up he's now the Saturday guy for the Troy Trojans the last couple of weeks. What has it been like being around him? Being And I know he's somebody that you know pretty well, mm -hmm. being around Troy all of the time. What is it like when he takes the mound for this team? Well, the the thing that strikes me, and you're right, Colin, it was in a midweek game against Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and uh, we saw him out there warming up, and we're think in the in the bullpen, and we're thinking, what's this all about? We had heard that it was a possibility, but um, he comes out there, and you really didn't know what to expect. He and he came out there, and from the beginning. He looked polished. He looked like he belonged. He is one of my favorites. He's an absolute joy to be around. Uh, Doubles Alley loves him out in left <laughs> field. He is he is always outgoing. He's a great guy, but, and, and I'm serious, he is one of the nicest human beings that I've been associated with in any sport in 20 years at Troy. But, Colin, you get him between the lines, and he wants to grind you in the dust. I mean, we, we, you know players like that. I've known yeah. players like that in all different sports. Nicest guy in the world, but on the mound, what really sets him apart 
He's a left-hander who throws 90 miles an hour. He can get up to 93, so that's legitimate. Really good off-speed stuff. He has got a polished arsenal, but the thing that really has struck um, about him is the effect he has on the teammates around him because he is so competitive. He doesn't shy away from the moment. He doesn't shy away from the challenge. And when the chips have been down, he's been even better if that's possible. Offensive side, you'll still see Mosley in that lineup for Troy, obviously. What's been the biggest part of him taking that next step while he's also focusing on focusing on pitching? What's been the biggest step for him offensively? <laughs> Well, the thing about him offensively over the last couple of weeks is that they've kind of taken him, um, they've taken him out of that equation some in that he, he mentioned that, uh, you know, when he, when he swings the bat, it kind of affects his arm, affects his shoulder a little bit. So they've been really careful with that. So in the last couple of weeks, he's only had a minimum number of at-bats. He didn't swing the bat at all, for instance, uh, against Georgia State and Arkansas State, just strictly because they want to keep him, you know, fresh on the mound. And, and it's made... It's made a bit of a difference, um, you know, having a left-handed bat in there. But, um, you know, he's he's ready to go. He is definitely a pinch-hitting prospect. He's definitely a DH prospect. And as you know, he's always been one of the best defensive outfielders in the Sun Belt Conference. So I'm like you. I'd be interested to see down the stretch, final month of the regular season, just how often you use him. It's such an anomaly because you look at all of the career numbers for Troy offensively. Uh, he is in the top five in career numbers and hits. Uh, he leads in all-time um doubles he leads the current team he's stolen 12 bases and he's been a full-time pitcher for the last two or three weeks so i'm interested in that as well losing a guy like that who's one of the top five all-time leaders in your school in hits um again it's a bit of a risk but uh we'll see what we'll see how it all turns out talk about the rest of this offense for troy you look at guys like donovan Wibbs leading the team with a 319 average what does the rest of this lineup look like now having to transition with mosley not in it well, it's it's a predominantly left-handed lineup. Wibbs is a left-handed hitter. He has really taken a step forward. He's terrific defensively. He is um, leading the team in hitting, and he's, I don't know, he's spent more than three games anywhere other than in the bottom three of the order. Uh, William Sullivan, Easton Kirk, Kyle Mock, Trey Leonard, all of those guys up and down the lineup, they're all left-handed. Uh, it's a predominantly left-handed team. Uh, there is some balance. Jesse Hall, the shortstop, he and Sullivan and, uh, and Wibbs have been so solid defensively. Hall leads the team in RBIs, believe it or not, which I never thought would happen. Uh, it's just been there's not been many holes. There's nobody who is, you know, in the top 10 in the league or the top five in the league in any individual statistic, but everybody's pretty good. Everybody knows what they're doing. It's been, it's been a team full of clutch hitters. Nobody that I would consider to be a guy who will just absolutely consistently knock the cover off the ball, but just a bunch of good hitters with good approaches and the way the lineup sets up now, it all kind of seems to fit the way it, uh, the way it's constructed right now with Hall and Sullivan in the two hole, and then another left-hander mock, then another left-hander Kirk, and then maybe a right-hander before the left-hander Trey Leonard. Looking on the pitching side of the equation, it's a rotation that has changed a little bit throughout the year, obviously with Rick Mosley coming into the weekend rotation the last couple of weeks, but somebody that has led the way Garrett Gaines actually left the game against Georgia state on Friday with an injury. Don't necessarily know his status right now of the weekend, but when you look at some of the different guys that have been a part of it, Bay Witcher is somebody that is now out of the weekend mm -hmm. rotation as of right now, but guys like Fuller that have been there pretty much the entirety of the season. What does this pitching staff really hang its hat on? Well, it hangs its hats on the ability to throw strikes. Uh, they're averaging, last time I checked last week, over 10 strikeouts a game. And uh, Coach Mead was talking with us about that after the Georgia State game. I think Troy pitchers struck out 38 Georgia State hitters. Now, they're prone to the strikeout, but he says that he believes that, you know, the strikeout can be taught, you know, and they accentuate that, not pitching to contact necessarily, but trying to make them miss bats. Uh, you can't defend a strikeout. And they've been really good about that. Uh, Gaines is a strikeout guy, a power guy. And I'm with you as we record this. I'm not, I, nobody knows his status. He has an MRI scheduled as we're talking right now. But um, 
he is a guy with a lot of swing and miss. He's got a rising fastball that's awfully tough to meet up with, uh, and he's been very good at home. Brady Fuller is a power guy, but a little bit different in that, you know, he pitches to contact a little bit more. He doesn't have that that swing and miss necessarily as much as Gaines does. And Rigsby is a guy who, um, again, throws 92, 93 with a really good change up and really good command and competitiveness as well. Witcher is a guy, is a, he's a pitch to contact guy. He's not going to strike out a lot, um, and he's a, a swing guy that can go uh, on a midweek. He can, obviously, he's gone a lot on the weekend as well. But the thing that this uh, staff is known for as much as anything else, pound the strike zone. They're not going to nibble around. They're not going to try and um, and get people to chase. They're going to come right at you. And it's a team, even through the bullpen, that is full of strike throwers. They don't walk many at all. And uh, they do have a lot of swing and miss in this staff's game. We've talked about Rigsby Mosley a lot. And outside of him, what has kind of been the biggest surprise for this team this year? There's a, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of things. Jesse Hall has been wonderful at the plate. He's always been a, a, a plus plus defender. You remember him last year. He was the third baseman with Drew Frederick at shortstop, and he plugs in at shortstop, and he's terrific defensively. But you didn't know you know how much he would hit. You know it'd be okay, but he's batting 300, leads the team in RBIs, a terrific clutch hitter. That's been a positive surprise. Um, Wibbs is another one. You mentioned him. Wibbs is a guy who came in not very strong. You know, kind of a skinny guy. Well, he's, uh, I think now he had two triples over the weekend. He is either at least tied for the league lead in triples. He really runs well. And a guy that I think you'll watch out for, that I think you'll appreciate this weekend, is the Louisville transfer, Trey Leonard. Leonard is in his only year at Troy. He's a grad student now, and he's played all different outfield positions. He's a guy who can really run left handed batter with occasional power, but he is one of those glue guys. He's got a terrific presence in the clubhouse. He knows what it takes to win. He's played in the College World Series before with the Cardinals. So he brings uh, not just a kind of a, a tool belt with him of speed, defense, um, versatility, and power, but he's a real leadership guy as well. Somebody that I didn't know before the season started just how much he would impact this program, but he's impacted it a lot in a lot of different ways. I want to talk about a couple of traditions to kind of shed the light on this Troy program a little bit more. You talk about doubles alley a little bit earlier. You guys do a game or a couple throughout the year out in doubles alley on the radio. Talk about doubles alley, kind of the origins of it and how it kind of became a part of a huge part of Troy. Well, to be honest with you, years ago, there was a fan group out there. They called themselves Barry's Boys, and they uh, <laughs> they morphed into Doubles Alley. There's just a lot of people who who love the Trojans, Gunner Whetstone and Becky Whetstone and my wife, Dee. She's in the middle of all of it, and Seth Parker. I can't know all the names, but they're out there. And, uh, you know, they'll grill and they'll maybe give the opposing left fielder a hard time, but they'll also give them their props. By the end of the by the end of the series last year, you'll remember they were all saluting Mac McWhorter left and right. <laughs> they said, OK, you shut us up. That's for sure. But they appreciate good baseball. They love the Trojans. And the thing that's fun about them is that they're there no matter what. They never miss a game. They never take a game off. We had a rain delay in the Sunday game against Georgia State this past weekend, and they never budged out there uh, and they keep the game our game broadcast, our radio broadcast going out there. And uh, every once in a while, they'll, they'll maybe feed the opposing left fielder a chicken wing through the chain link or something <laughs> like that. It's just a lot of fun. And the coaches and the fans and the, the, um, the players just absolutely love it. The other one that we have made known over our broadcast whenever we're at Troy is the fact that during the seventh inning stretch, you are the one that sings, take me out to the ball game. Where did that really start? It began my first year, uh, 20 years ago. And this is a, this is, this is a true story. Uh, it was maybe the second or third game, uh, third home game. And in the uh, in the booth, everybody, all the game ops people, here comes the seventh inning and, you know, they're playing, you know, the, the, just the song and they're looking at each other the second game and saying, do you want to sing it? Well, I'm not going to sing it. You sing. I'm not going to sing it. And after about the third game, I said, that's enough. I mean, I know the words. And I said, I'll sing it. So, you know, seventh inning break, we take the break. I go run, get the microphone, the headphones, and I, you know, they play it behind me. And, you know, you jazz it up a little bit. You try to make it entertaining and all that. And it was supposed to be just a one-off for me. I just wanted to show them, hey, somebody can do this thing. It's not that hard. Well, our chancellor, uh, who's right behind me, right up here, Dr. Jack Hawkins, uh, happened to be in the stands for that game. And he came over afterwards and said, you know, Barry, that added a lot of pizzazz. 
So I've had to do it for every home game since for the last 20 years, and they love it. It's, you know, it's funny. A lot of people give me a hard time about it because I'm not the most uh, extroverted personality out there. But, you know, people remember me for that. I'm, I'm fine with it. That's for sure. Barry, appreciate you taking some time. Looking forward to getting to catch up this weekend when you guys come to Statesboro. Man, I cannot begin to tell you just how much high-level baseball we're expecting. Troy's playing at a really good pace right now. Good gosh, Georgia Southern is uh, playing as good a baseball as anybody despite last weekend. I still think it's going to be high-quality baseball, and I can't wait to call it, Colin. For sure. Thank you, Barry. Take care. Once again, that's the great voice of the Troy Trojans and Barry McKnight going to be making the trip to Statesboro and J.I. Clemens Stadium for this weekend series for Georgia Southern and Troy. 6.30 on Friday, 2 o'clock on Saturday, 1 o'clock on Sunday for the series finale for Georgia Southern against the Trojans of Troy. We'll be on the air with the Cutwater Spirits on deck circle 30 minutes prior to each, but really appreciate everybody that we've had on today. Danny catching up with Seth Schumann now in the Washington Nationals organization. Barry McKnight again, the voice of the Troy Trojans and of course Ryan Chambers former colleague with the Georgia Southern Sports Network a big part of the reason Georgia Southern baseball on the radio is the way it is today but that'll wrap things up for us until next week and until this weekend when Georgia Southern baseball takes on the Trojans of Troy this is Colin Lacey saying so long everybody you've been listening to Inside Eagle Nation powered by Learfield the official podcast of Georgia Southern Athletics 